And now, act two of The Bell of Amherst, starring Julie Harris. Maggie? Maggie, watch for the coach. I'll be upstairs. Oh, surely. This is the day. Maggie? Maggie, when he comes, ask him to wait in the hall. Oh, it's almost time. Oh, what to say? Mr. Higginson. How is Mrs. Higginson? <laughs> Good noon, Professor Higginson. How is Mrs. Higginson? Oh, enchanted, Mr. Higginson. How is sweet, Mrs. Higginson? <laughs> Another confinement. Oh. <laughs> oh, Sherry, it's father's best. Oh, yes, August is a glorious month. Please. <laughs> oh, Mr. Higginson, how droll. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of that, how witty. Oh, my favorite books. Well, let me think. Uh, Jane Eyre, I loved. And The Mill on the Floss. And of course, your inspired novel, Malbone. <laughs> How did you do it? <laughs> Coach. Oh, stop it. Oh, he's, he's taller than I thought. And so imposing. Maggie. Maggie, the door! Oh. Courage, Emily. Higginson, and I to meet you. How long are you going to stay? Uh, well, what I mean is, why has it taken eight years? Oh, I, I know you've been so busy, and, and then you were away in the war, the, the Civil War, wasn't it? War to me is so oblique, I can't grasp it. My wars are laid away in books, but now, to the real purpose of your visit, <laughs> I've been waiting to hear from your own lips what you're planning for my poems. I have them all right here, all the ones I've sent you. These, these are the first four, and these are the later ones. I, I bound them together. Oh, and this one, um, I'll tell you how the sun rose. Oh, this was Sue's choice. Oh, Sue is, is my sister-in-law. Th th that's her house over there. It, it's not what I would have chosen, but perhaps for publication it's more appropriate, more appealing to the reading public. But you will be the best judge of that, Mr. Higginson. And I have many that, that you might feel would be better for a printed collection. Many, oh, so many. <laughs> Over a thousand, enough for several volumes, I should think. I, I would prefer Morocco bound. <laughs> oh, but Mr. Higginson... I must apologize. I'm not giving you a chance to say anything. Could you tell me how to grow? Or is it unconveyed, like melody or witchcraft? Oh, please, feel free to choose the poems you think are best for a book. And, and as for publishers, well, I rely solely on your judgment. After all, you are my preceptor. But my, my meter is uh, new, it's uh, experimental, not spasmodic. Bad rhymes. Oh, no, you, you don't understand what I'm trying to... If only I could explain. Uncontrolled. But, Mr. Higginson, when I, when I try to organize, my little force explodes. But surely a publisher will recognize. I, 
I, I mean, I mean, surely. A great hope fell. Oh, you heard no noise. The ruin was within. Oh, cunning wreck that told no tale. And let no witness in. A not admitting of the wound until it grew so wide that all my life had entered it. And there were troughs beside. A closing of the simple lid that opened to the sun until the tender carpenter perpetual nail it down. Well, I still send him poems, but always from his polite replies. I, I get the uneasy feeling that they end up in some dusty drawer in his office. Well, I can talk about this now. But when I heard Mr. Higginson's words, I became ill. But then I understand another poet met with the same disappointing reception from Professor Higginson, but he didn't give up as I did. He got his poems published somehow. His book has gone through nine editions already, and Professor Higginson says that his poems are absolutely scandalous. His name, Walt Whitman. <laughs> Perhaps no one will ever read my poems. They seem to me like an undelivered letter, lost in transit. Destiny is strange, going to be famous. If fame belonged to me, I couldn't escape her. And if she didn't, well, the longest day would pass me on the chase. The approbation of my dog would forsake me then. My barefoot rank is better. It's not that I haven't had fame of sorts. One October, my rye and Indian bread won second prize at the cattle show. Second prize was 75 cents. And in case you missed the newspaper, my heliotropes won honorable mention. <laughs> I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they banish us, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. <laughs> Vinny always said that my withdrawal into seclusion was only a happen. I suppose my not marrying was only a happen, too. Oh, I know I'm plain and small like the wren, but my hair is bold like the chestnut burr, and my eyes like the sherry in the glass that the guest leaves. I never had but one picture taken of myself. It's not among those. This daguerreotype, when I was 17, plain. Now, now that's a word not to lift your hat to. Oh, you see this neck ribbon? That was Vinnie's touch. She made it. Oh, I know what people say. Poor Emily, the only kangaroo among the beauties. <coughs> Is it any wonder I keep it in a drawer? But I'll have you know that, plain or not, I had more than one suitor. They were all married and older than I. There was really only one. Only one. It was in Philadelphia, years ago, that I first saw Charles Wadsworth. I was 24. I hadn't meant to tell you this. Vinnie and I had, had visited Father in Washington, 
while he was a congressman. And on the way home, we stayed two weeks with the Coleman's in Philadelphia. We attended the Presbyterian Church where Mr. Wadsworth was minister. When I first laid eyes on him that Sunday morning, it was as if heaven's own lightning struck me. Here before me was a Christ-like man. He seemed like Gabriel standing before the congregation. When I walked out of the church into the brilliant morning, the light in my heart was shining even brighter. His voice haunted me. I couldn't shake off the enchantment. Even after we returned to Amherst, and I wrote to him, well, at first, hesitant, a cautious letter asking about spiritual things, redemption, immortality. And finally, in his answers, I detected a response not unlike my own emotions, but well, more subtle, sensitive, hidden. <coughs> it's an exquisite experience to love someone in a bodiless way, like fleshless lovers forever one. Such love was the limit of my dream. It was the focus of my prayer. It made me different from before as if I breathed superior air. A wild night, wild night, were I with thee, wild nights should be our luxury, futile the winds to a heart in port, done with a compass, done with a chart, rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but moor tonight, in thee, I called him my master. I spoke with him only twice in my life, 20 years apart, the first time in 1860. And he came to me again three years ago. Then he came running to get me. She said, a gentleman with a deep voice wants to see you, Emily. Again. His voice is at the door. I feel the old degree. I hear him ask the servant for such an one as me. I take a flower as I go, my face to justify. He never saw me in this life. I might surprise his eye. I cross the hall with mingled steps. I silent past the door. I look on all this world contains. Just his face. Nothing more. Well, where did you come from? Ah, the pulpit to the train. But why didn't you tell me you were coming so so I could have it to hope for. Oh, you, you didn't know yourself. You just came. How long was your journey? 20 years. <laughs> yes, it, it has been that long, hasn't it? Oh, but I'm older too, Master. But the love is the same. And so big that it scares me. Oh, no. No, say I may wait for you. I waited a long time, Master, but I can wait more <laughs> till my hazel hair is dappled and, and you carry the cane. And then I can look at my watch. And if the day is too far declined, then we can take our chances for heaven. Master, open your light wide and take me in forever. And I will be your best little girl. Nobody else will see me but you, but that's enough. I shall not want any more. I'm sorry. I know I cannot live with you. It would be life.
And life is over there, behind the shelf, the sexton keeps the key to putting up our life is porcelain, like a cup discarded of the housewife, so we must keep apart, you there, I hear, with just the door ajar, that oceans are, and prayer, and that pale sustenance despair. And I am so moved, just to look in your face, while you look in mine. Will you come to Amherst again? You can't. No, I understand. Yes, I am content. I shall always be content now. Goodbye, Master. to look behind it a pain than to see it coming when the best is gone I know that other things are not of consequence the heart wants what it wants or else it does not care last year in April my master died Will there really be a morning? Is there such a thing as day? Could I see it from the mountains if I were as tall as they? Has it feet like water lily? Has it feathers like a bird? Is it brought from famous countries of which I have never heard? <laughs> oh, some scholar. Or some sailor, or some wise man from the skies, please to tell a little pilgrim where the place called morning lies. Yes, I still write poetry, but not as much as I used to. There are so few listeners, and those who should be the best listeners, like Professor Higginson, are deaf. But even yet, when I see a tall, pale snowstorm stalking through the fields and, and bowing at my window, I find I must translate my feelings into poetry. Sometimes I put both hands on the window pane and try to think how birds fly and imitate and fail. I could make a balloon of a dandelion, but the fields are gone. I talk of all these things with my dog and his eyes grow meaning and his shaggy feet keep a slower pace. Animals have a natural, simple wisdom, except chickens, of course. <laughs> At present, we have 24 invalid hens who do nothing so vulgar as lay an egg. <laughs> but I do remember one Christmas when the cats came to the door with Santa Claus and the cats washed themselves in the open air without chilling their tongues. Atmospherically, it was the most beautiful Christmas on record. Maggie gave her hens checks for potatoes and each of the cats had a gilt-edged bone and the horses had both new blankets from Boston. It was a lovely Christmas. And Vinnie's cats leave the chickens alone. They're good about that. But in summer, they're forever catching snakes and carrying them into the kitchen. And poor Vin is deathly afraid of snakes. Ooh! But when I hear a scream or a crash from the kitchen, I know what's happened. When we were little, I used to hide behind a tree with a garter snake in my hand. And when Vinnie come along, I'd wave it in her face and chase her all over the orchard. Well, Austin did it too. I love those little green ones. You know the ones that slide around by your shoes in the grass and make it rustle with their elbows. A narrow fellow in the grass occasionally rides. You may have met him, did you not? His notice sudden is. The grass divides as with a comb. A spotted shaft is seen. And then it closes at your feet and opens further on. He likes 
a boggy acre of floor too cool for corn. Yet when a boy and barefoot, I more than once at noon have passed, I thought a whiplash on braiding in the sun and stooping to secure it, it wrinkled and was gone. Now several of nature's people I know, and they know me. I feel for them a transport of cordiality, but never met this fellow, attended or alone, without a tighter breathing and zero at the bone. Did I tell you that my father loved animals? Well, he did. He had beautiful horses. During his last winter, that was nine years ago, there were several snowstorms, and the birds were so frightened and cold, they sat outside the kitchen door, and father went over to the barn in his slippers and brought back a breakfast of grain for each. And he hid himself while he scattered it, lest it embarrass them. <laughs> Ignorant of the name and fate of their benefactor, their descendants are singing this afternoon. During the last afternoon that my father lived, though with no premonition, I preferred to be with him and invented an absence for mother, Vinnie being asleep, and he seemed peculiarly pleased, as I often have stayed with myself, and he remarked as the afternoon withdrew that he would like it not to end. His pleasure almost embarrassed me, and my brother coming, I suggested they walk, and Next morning, I woke him for the train and saw him no more. Father doesn't live with us now. He lives in a new house. Though it was built in an hour, it is better than this. But he hasn't any garden because he moved after gardens were made, so we take him the best flowers. And if we only knew that he knew, perhaps we could stop crying. Though it is many nights, my mind never comes home. At the funeral, Austin leaned over the coffin and kissed Father's forehead and said, There, Father, I never dared do that while you were living. <laughs> Father rescued are trifling in his trees. How flippant are the saved. They were they were even frolicking with the grave when Vinnie went there yesterday. Nature must be too young to feel. Or many years too old. I dream about father every night. Always a different dream. I forget what I'm doing daytime. <laughs> Wondering where he is. Without any body, I keep thinking, what kind can that be? You know, he never, he never really learned how to play. And the straightest engine has its leaning hour. His heart was pure and terrible. I think no other like it exists. I'm glad there is immortality, but I would have tested it myself before entrusting him. Home. So far from home since my father died. My life closed twice before it's closed. It yet remains to see if immortality unveil a third event to me, so huge, so hopeless to conceive as those that twice befell. Parting is all we know of heaven. 
and all we need of hell. Oh, uh, I'll never forget Father's coming home from his office <laughs> for noontime dinner. Up Main Street he'd come like a deacon, carrying his gold-headed cane and wearing his glossy beaver hat. Oh, Vinny, Vinny, Father's coming. Quick, hide the mop and bucket. You fell down the stairs. <laughs> How did you? Oh, Mother, oh, Mother, take the handkerchief off your head. What's that smell? Maggie? Maggie, it's the cabbage. I think it's boiling over. Oh, Vinny, do something about Buffy. She's clawing the sofa. Oh, oh. oh Father's coming in the gate. He's almost here. Oh, Mother, did you check the thermometer? I hung it in the east window. Yes, I'll see to the fire. Buffy, out of Father's chair. Scat! <laughs> Vinny, where's Father's newspaper? No, it's not by his chair. I haven't even seen it yet. Oh, damn! Oh, I found it. <laughs> well, it. It was in your sewing basket. Oh, there he is. He's at the door. Oh, good noon, Father. <laughs> Did you have a fine morning at the office? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, it was very quiet here. Very peaceful, restful morning, wasn't it, Mother? Uh, uh, Vinny, is she limping? I didn't notice. <laughs> Awful smell. I don't smell anything, Father. Oh, the temperature. Mother, Father wants to know the temperature. Oh, it's 14 degrees. Ooh, it's 14 degrees, Father. Your spectacles are on your nose, Father. Oh, the newspaper. Yes, yes, Father, it's right here. Well, it is a little bit wrinkled, but speak to Vinny, it's Buffy. Oh, Maggie's ready for us, Father. Oh, it's your favorite corned beef and cat. <laughs> you see? Pandemonium. And now, the house is so quiet. With just Vinny and me. Ever since Father died, I've worried about Vinny. She says the strangest thing. She treats me as if I were a child and she my nursemaid. We had a terrible fire in Amherst on the 4th of July at night, you remember, and Vinnie tried to make me believe that it was only the holiday fireworks. She kept saying, don't be afraid, Emily, don't be afraid. It's only the 4th of July, but I know a fire when I see one. And what a night that was for Mr. Frink and his noble fire brigade. I mean, for a while it was light as day. There were people running up and down the street shouting. It seemed like a theater night in London. Mother slept through it all. <laughs> And Vinnie kept saying, don't be afraid, it's only the 4th of July. Vinnie's only the 4th of July. I shall always remember. I think she'll tell me that when I'm dying, to keep me from being afraid. A year after father died, mother had a stroke in her room. And she never walked again. I suspect that Mother was afraid of dying. She always avoided talking about it. One night when Austin and I were discussing the extension of consciousness after death, Mother told Vinnie afterwards she thought it was very improper. Mother's dying almost stunned my spirit. She slipped from our fingers like a flake gathered by the wind it is now part of the drift called the infinite this was the way she died and when her breath was done took up her simple wardrobe and started for the sun her little figure at the gate the angels must have spied since I could never find her upon the mortal side you see we were never intimate as mother and children while she was our mother, but minds in the same ground meet by tunneling. And when she became our child, the affection came. Hold your parents tenderly, for the world will seem a strange and lonely place when they're gone. Oh, I wish I were 
just a blade of grass. And there are all these problems of the dust wouldn't terrify me. Why do we cling to this body, this little frame? Why are we afraid to let go or sad when others do if my own machinery should get slightly out of gear? Please, someone stop the wheel, for I know that with belts and bands of gold, I shall wear triumphant on the new streams. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stopped at all and sweetest in the gayless herd, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest seas, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Oh, I heard from Helen. She's in California now, a seaside village called Santa Monica. Helen says the sun shines there all the time and there is bougainvillea everywhere. Well, Abby Bliss and her husband have just founded the Syrian Protestant College in Beirut. Oh, and I had a lovely letter from Samuel Bowles and his wife Mary. And, and they enclosed these wonderful stereopticon pictures. Look at this. It's the Scottish Moors. <laughs> Isn't this a lovely thing? Vinnie gave it to me. Last Christmas, they're all the rage. It's the Keystone View Company. Oh, and this one is from the Louvre. It's the Mona Lisa. I don't see what all the excitement's about. <laughs> <laughs> And this one is the Blue Grotto at Capri. Mary said they had to row out from the island to see it. Well, everyone is somewhere except Emily. And Emily's here, always here. I never saw more. I never saw the sea. Yet know I how the heather looks? No. And what a wave. <laughs> Wave must be. I never spoke with God, nor visited in heaven, yet certain am I of the spot as if the chart were given. Vinny says a little boy ran away from Amherst a few days ago, and when asked where he was going, he replied, Vermont, or Asia. <laughs> what a smart little boy. I told Vinny that I wanted to run away too. I rise because the sun shines, and sleep is over with, and I brush my hair and dress myself and wonder what I am. And who has made me so? I tie my hat, I crease my shawl. Life's little duties do precisely as the very least were infinite to me. I put new blossoms in the glass and throw the old away. I push a petal from my gown that anchored there. I weigh the time it will be till six o'clock. I have so much to do. And yet existence, some way back, stops, struck my ticking through. Therefore we do life's labor, though life's reward be done with scrupulous exactness to hold our senses on. Oh, but there are the children. Thank God for that. They keep my imagination keen and alive. Austin and Sue gave me a niece and two nephews. Ned and Martha are the oldest, and little Gilbert, little Gilbert was born when Ned was 14. When Gilbert was small, he was stung by a wasp on his arm, and he begged Sue through his tears to read the Bible to the wasp. <laughs> and when he was six, he and a little friend had a 
an animal show in a tent on the lawn, and, and we asked him what he was going to do with all those pennies he gathered for his mission, and he said, well, we're going to give half to the college and half to the cat. <laughs> And when Sue tried to teach him how to sing There's No Place Like Home, he broke in and said, oh, yes, there is, too, over at Aunt Emily's. <laughs> over at Aunt Emily's. Oh, October is a mighty month. For in it, little Gilbert died at eight years. Typhoid. Not my little Gib. I see him in the star. Meet his sweet velocity and everything that flies. The little boy we laid away never fluctuates. His dim society is companion still. His last cry in delirium was, open the door, open the door, they're waiting for me. Quite used to his commandment, his little aunt obeyed. Who were waiting for him? All we possess, we would give to know. All this and more. But is there more? Dear friends, more than love and death? Tell me its name. I reason earth is short and anguish, absolute and many hurt, but what of that? I reason we could die. The best vitality cannot excel decay, but what of that? I reason that in heaven, somehow it will be even, some new equation given. But what of that? I've had a curious winter, very swift, sometimes sober. I, I haven't felt well much, and March amazes me. Well, I didn't think about it, that's all. And I hayed for the horse two Sundays ago, and it snowed since. But now, the full circle of seasons, spring has come, although delayed. But I would eat evanescence slowly. And the lawn is full of south, and the odors tangle. And did you hear today for the first, the river in the tree? Spring is a happiness so beautiful, so unique. So unexpected, I, I don't know what to do with my heart. I dare not leave it, I dare not take it. What do you advise? Eight Saturday noons ago, I was making my black cake with Maggie, dear Maggie, and I saw a great darkness coming and I knew no more until late at night and I, I awoke and found Austin and, <coughs> and Vinny in a strange position of, a Dr. Bigelow bending over me and supposed that I was dying, or had died, all was so kind and hallowed. But I had fainted, lay unconscious for the first time in my life. Now what flower did Austin plant on Gilbert's grave? Oh, it was lilies of the valley. I remember. And on father and mother's it was dams and hawthorn. Well, when it shall come my turn, I want a buttercup. Surely the grass will give me one. I told Vinnie that I wanted to be carried in a little white coffin out the back door of Homestead and into the blue, beloved air and through my garden and father's barn and out over the meadows of Amherst to the burial ground. And for my requiem, <laughs> that phraseless melody the wind does, and I can hear Vinnie say, don't talk like that, Emily. But I say, don't be afraid, dear Vinnie. It's only the 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> My earliest friend wrote me the week before he died, if I live, I will go to Amherst. If I die, I certainly will. <laughs> A democratic death. Life is short, isn't it? And when one is done, I wonder, is there not another? And then, if God is willing, perhaps we are neighbors again. I wonder if I've ever dreamed or if I'm dreaming now. I cannot tell how eternity seems. It sweeps around me like a sea. And this world is such a little place.
just the red in the sky before the sun rises. So let us keep fast hold of hands, please. So when the birds begin, none of us be missing. The name they dropped upon my face with water in the country church, Emily Elizabeth. It's finished using now. And they can put it with my dolls, my childhood, and the string of spools I finished threading. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste. And I had put aside my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children played, their lessons scarcely done. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. We paused before a house. Seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible. The cornice but a mound. Since then, tis centuries. And yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised. The horses' heads were toward eternity. <coughs> oh, it's six o'clock. Well, I promised Vinnie that I would peel the apples. You know, our visit was easier than I thought. We, we very seldom have guests anymore. Oh, yes, Vinnie, I'm coming. Oh, but one more thing. This... This is my letter to the world that never wrote to me the simple news that nature told with tender majesty. Her message is committed to hands I cannot see for love of her. Sweet countrymen, judge tenderly of me. And when you make my cake, please tell me how you like it. And, and when next we meet, I'll give you my recipe for gingerbread. Gingerbread. Now there's a word to lift you. Yes, Vinnie, I'm here. today. This and my heart beside. This and my heart and all the fields and all the meadows wide. Be sure you count, should I forget. Someone the sun could tell. This and my heart and all the bees which in the clover dwell. We give you our parting love. This program was made possible by a grant from International Business Machines Corporation.